Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Soul Focus Radio. We're your hosts, Kristen Farmer, Martina Tam, and Martin Friedman. Hey you guys, how are you? How's everybody doing? I'm doing very well. Excited to be here and always to talk to you all. Like Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, it's nice for us to have two back-to-back episodes with all three of us and start getting into the rhythm of our co-hosting situation. My voice might sound a little bit off. I'm a, I'm just uh, struggling with a little bit of a cold. And as I share with people uh, on a recent episode, I've been working to help my mom close out her house and move into a different living situation. So uh, last week was was a lot of that work and a lot of 58-year-old dust and all kinds of other stuff going on. So I'm excited to be back in Florida and, and relax. So I'm doing all right, but I, my voice might sound a little off. And um, how are you doing, Martina? Oh, I'm doing really well. Like Kristen said, excited to be here with all of you. Excited for the transition to spring and kind of all the new beginnings that are manifesting around us outside and trying to have those reflect on kind of manifestations on the inside as well. Awesome. And what about you, Kristen? I would have to second Martina on welcoming the spring. Today is the first day of April, so happy April. And really, really looking forward to new beginnings, this new chapter in my life. There's so much that's been happening around me that is propelling me to move into the next phase of my life. And I'm just really excited. I'm afraid but positively afraid because of the transformation and changes that come leaving behind your old life to go and step into your new life. Nice. Yeah. I um, was reflecting this morning on the concept of big transformations in our life and that, you know, somebody used the terminology like miracles. And a lot of times we think about these transformations or you know, we could think about a miracle in many ways as a transformation that we aren't expecting in our lives, but it's not, you know, we have this sort of idea that it's going to be easy and kind of dramatically wonderful, but there's a lot of difficulty sometimes and pain, painfulness that comes along with the miracles. So I don't know, you just made me think of that, Kristen, because um, it's not, it's not our topic today. Our topic today is, is cultural appreciation. But just when you said that, you made me think about that fact that when we go through these transformations, it's not like a movie where the, you know, where you have like romantic music playing in a collage, uh, you know, of different scenes, but there's often a lot of uh, painful, you know, painful things that go along with these transformations that we're going through. Absolutely. 100%. It's really called as being a human being. <laughs> It's not just the the rosy parts. It is the, you know, challenges and things that come to you that you overcome is what make it just a worthwhile experience. Well, I think this is probably a good time for us to 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 jump in. And our topic today is going to be cultural appreciation. And I would say this is a newer topic as I understand it, or a newer idea that in many ways, I think some people that were tired of the concept of cultural appropriation said, you know, well, we need to talk about a different way to be in relationship with people's cultures. Not everything that's not your birth culture is going to be cultural appropriation. So I think that's kind of the motivation where this came from. Um, But it's a really interesting topic. It's a topic that a lot of people are looking up right now, like online and stuff. And so we wanted to, we wanted to talk about it from the perspective, you know, next week we'll get more into sort of the cultural appropriation versus appreciation argument or discussion, but I think not argument discussion. We don't argue. Um, on this podcast. You know, really today we really want to look at just what is cultural appreciation. And the definition, as I understand it, it's the practice of of connecting to other cultures from a place of interest, reflection, relationship, centering yourself in who you are and not trying to be someone else necessarily. I'm actually, it's funny, I'm trying to define it without using the uh, 
the nots, the negatives. So to do that, I would say that cultural appreciation is a relational way to engage in someone else's culture where you're centering who you are and what you bring culturally you know, to the table. It's really funny, you all. It's like hard to do this without saying what it's not. I'm really pushing myself here. <laughs> You know, so it it is a, it is about a relational way. Uh, it's it's being in relationship with people of other cultures, where you are broadening your knowledge and your connection to people based on being in an open, honest, reciprocal relationship with people of other cultures. And we wanted to, you know, start our podcast today with Martina and talking to you about your recent trip to Africa using this con- this concept of cultural appreciation to kind of just hear about your your recent experiences and then we'll we'll do a segment where we'll just kind of break it down even more about what cultural appreciation is. So, yeah, I think that's it for me unless you all have anything you want to say before we get going with our next segment. No, I'm just, I'm really excited to hear from Martina and her experience. All right, we'll be right back with Martina's trip to Africa. It was Carl Jung, famous psychologist and psychiatrist, I think he was a student of Sigmund Freud, who once said, when asked by one of his students, what is an ego? He said, the ego is this. He said, the world will ask you who you are, and if you say to the world you don't know, then the world will proceed to tell you who you are. And who the world tells you that you are becomes your ego. Your ego is who you are trying to be for other people. At the Soul Focus Group, we spend a lot of time recognizing that for years we have been leading off by trying to please people and we have to reduce the size of our ego to get back into our soul. There are so many beautiful lessons for us to learn from our ego. It's not a negative thing, it is a something to learn thing. At the Soul Focus Group, we learn how to reduce our ego, which translates to us reducing our performative behavior and really start showing up authentic. All right. So we are back. And um, Martina, um, we know that just recently, part of the reason why we took a, a nice little hiatus um, from the from these podcasts is you know, we were transitioning with, with Cindy leaving Soul Focus Group and Kristen coming on as our, our co-host. But also you um, took a pretty extended trip to Africa with your family. So can you just tell us a little bit about the trip and the backstory and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, so we were gone for about three weeks, and we traveled to Kenya in East Africa, which is where my partner is from. And so we were traveling to visit his family and like give them a chance to meet our daughter, Makeba. And so he grew up in Nairobi, in the capital, and so we spent a few days there. Um, but then his hometown, where his family is from, is in western Kenya, near Lake Victoria, Um, in a town called Migori, right on the border with Tanzania. And so that's where we spent the majority of our time um, visiting his his parents, Makeba's grandparents, and more extended family there. So it was really just a focus on just spending time with family. And I think a lot of the word uh, in Spanish, convivir, which means like to live with, just like just living with each other. And that's really what we did. We just hung out for three weeks with them, which was so fantastic. Wow. I love that. And so with you saying that it was really about family and staying with family and in family, what sort of were the differences with how the culture there uh, gather with family as opposed to the culture, maybe American culture, for example? Did you see many differences between um, how we view family or how we um, interact with family? Yeah, that's such a great question, Kristen. And um, I think the thing that was most striking to me was kind of the role of children and the freedom of children. So we're in a, a smallish town, um, still has like a busy downtown area, but they don't live right in that downtown area. So kids are just so free to walk around. Like one story that really stands out to me is we went to visit a friend who has a two-year-old granddaughter and our daughter is about a year old and the two-year-old. So we got there and we're like, Oh, Hey, so where's your granddaughter? And she's like, Oh, I don't know. She's just like out walking around. 
And her granddaughter was just at two out walking on the street, doing her own thing, came back, opened the gate to the compound, like walked in, just totally independent, walked up the stairs, went and served herself some food, just like amazingly independent. And I think about, you know, we we have this saying in English, the terrible twos. And the only child I saw having temper tantrums was our own child. And I thought a lot about how much freedom the kids have where there's so much more independence that there just didn't seem to be these temper tantrums because kids were just free to do what they wanted to do. And then the older kids, you know, I mean, starting at like age seven, we're watching out for the younger kids. And I feel like it's so much easier for kids to listen to another child than to listen to an adult. And so it was just really beautiful to see the richness of childhood and how much time was spent playing with other children and how much independence they had just to explore the world on their own terms. I love that. Recently, I was just speaking with the group and uh, they were sort of making comparisons similar to that, but of Japan and American culture, because Japanese culture also has this more sense of independence for children at a younger age. So that's so interesting to see that happening and you know, different parts of the world. And it, that's a point of appreciation, just being able to see the differences between our cultures. Yeah. And I, Kristen, I don't know, in the Japanese culture was their discussion of what I really saw is that kind of all adults. And like I said, children starting at around age seven, even took responsibility of watching out for the kids around them. There were just, there was such a community sense mm-hmm. of, you know, this child is all of our our children, our child. And so we're, we're all going to watch out for him or her. Mm-hmm. And it's like an ingrained sense of community. It's not necessarily something that's taught, but it's taught through demonstration. So the kids just learn uh, that that's what you are supposed to do. And they just grow up in that, you know, and that speaks to culture and a community piece. I, I love it. Yeah. And it, it also showed me that what, our kids can do and how much I think we often underestimate their capabilities. I was just going to say, you know, my favorite thing to talk about or to say is around the 98%. It always just takes me back to (laughs) the 98% creative genius, you know, how we do tend to underestimate children, but they are actually operating at their higher source energy at that Mm -hmm. age. So, you know, we can learn so much from them. Yeah, I, I appreciate you saying that, Kristen, because what I was thinking of as you were saying that, uh, Martina, is, you know, the concept of like it takes a village is, you know, it's something that I remember we talked a lot about in this country. I think especially we talked about it during the Obama administration, but it's certainly something that we talked a lot about in the uh, anti-racist organizing world was that, you know, this was a different cultural way of knowing and being. And that was that it was, you know, not just a a nuclear family, uh, you know, two parents and then, you know, 2.5 kids, but it was everybody's responsibility. And that's my sense of what you're saying, Martine, is that a two-year-old can, can walk around the streets because, Everybody knows who everybody's child is. Everybody has a level of responsibility and accountability to each other. And that it really is that raising the village idea. Um, I mean, raising you know children as a village. And that's sort of one question, if, if, if that's what you saw in terms of, of, of cultural appreciation. And then I think the second part, based on what you just said, Kristen, is that you know how might that actually lead to or land towards children being able to stay in their genius place longer than having less freedom and more pressures to conform to certain cultural norms. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. I think it was definitely this idea of just the, you know, the village helping to raise a child. And I think it also plays out from what at least my experiences of much less of this sort of linear, this is what I own, this is my family, this is mine, 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 and much more of the communal aspect. So it didn't apply for me what I saw in just, okay, we are all here to help support this child, but also kind of this whole idea of things are here to be shared, and I don't have to always be in competition with each other. And I want to 
answer your other question and then get to sort of the question about cultural appreciation in this, you know, again, I'm no expert, but it definitely this still thinking about this two year old who we saw. I mean, she was an absolute genius. She spoke multiple languages. She was already counting to 20 in those languages. Um, you know, when I remember I was outside with her and the chickens were getting into an area they shouldn't, and she knew to, to scare them off. And she just had such a confidence about herself. Um, like her grandma described her as like, oh, she really loves herself. Like she won't sit on the floor. She at a young age learned how to climb onto a chair because she was like, I'm worthy of a chair. I'm not the I'm above the ground. <laughs> and I just, I love that way her grandma described herself as, you know, her name is Howie. And she said, oh, Howie loves herself. Like she has standards and she's made that happen. So I definitely think kids are allowed to express and be in their creative genius for a longer time because I think there's the parents are just don't have to be as hovering I mean here like you can't leave your I feel like in Tacoma I can't leave my child outside alone because it's unsafe even though we have a fenced in yard right um like my husband had a case where someone called CPS on a family because their two-year-old was outside alone and that's a very real thing that could happen in this country. So there's this necessity to constantly be kind of hovering and monitoring, I feel like, every movement and step of our child. Um, and I feel like, you know, it really helped me realize how I, I didn't think I was, but I'm kind of this helicopter parent, like, oh, I don't want you to get hurt. I have to really, like, guide every moment and watch every moment of what you're doing. And that limits a kid's creativity, right? Because we're constantly telling them this is the way to do this. No, do this. Do it this way. Don't go up there. It's too dangerous. And so absolutely, I think at least I can say for my approach to parenting and how I feel like living in this country has necessitated me to be a little bit more sort of hovering over my child, I think definitely takes away from her creativity. Um, You know, I, I can't speak to how things progress in Kenya later on because the education system is pretty intense and Definitely there's aspects, I think, of colonialism still in the education system. And so I can't speak to how things play out once kids start school. But definitely the really little ones are given that freedom to be themselves and to then learn from other children, which I think is really vital too, to not learn from adults, but to learn from other kids. Oh, that is just, it's so beautiful. And it also makes me think about uh, my read an article about how Iceland and Iceland, they leave their babies outside while they go into restaurants and stores. Um, And so you can just see a line of strollers lined up outside of a store. There's no fear that someone might run off with a baby. There is just, it's expected because they're under, under the belief that the air helps the baby sleep longer, for example. And, you know, I appreciate there being this more trusting community um, from what you described and your experience in uh, Kenya. And that really says a lot uh, about our parents and, and how we go about it, but things that we can learn. And I think that that is the cultural appreciation piece. It's like we can learn from these other cultures. You know, what you just said just gave me a different perspective um, on parenting. And and I have a 15 year old, so I know all about not wanting your child to do anything, (laughs) you know, just to keep them what we perceive to be safe. Yeah, it's, um, you know, what you're saying is, is, is fascinating to me because what I'm one of the things I'm really curious about when we talk about cultural appreciation, Martina, it's, um, I definitely hear this deep appreciation for the connectedness of the people there and the, you know, this whole different way of, of viewing, you know, how, how a child is treated and raised. And then like, how did you bring yourself into that? Like, what was your approach in terms of relationship to um, Moses's family and, you know, who is now McCabe's family and now your family. So what was your approach in terms of bringing your, your full self into that culturally appreciative relationship? Yeah. So Martin, that's such a great question. There's a couple of things that 
I'm really hoping to share that your question spoke to. So I think for me, a big thing about overall cultural appreciation means being grounded in oneself. And for me, being grounded in myself and my culture so that I can come and really connect with another person, another person's culture and create that human connection. I think where we lose cultural appreciation, and I know we're not going to talk a lot about this this week, but I just want to mention and move towards appropriation is when we don't have a strong grounding in our own culture and our own self. And so we go somewhere just to take and not to exchange. And so how how I have approached and how my experiences of trying to do cultural appreciation, you know, when I was visiting Moses's family and my in-laws is also, is being able to do that sharing back and forth. And I feel so fortunate because my family, so my parents, my brother and sister were all able to come in 2019 to Kenya and live with Moses's family for two weeks when we did a, a wedding ceremony there. So for me, that set a big foundation of the cultural appreciation because my parents are pretty strong and strongly grounded in their culture. So German and Chinese from Hong Kong. And so they're really able to bring that and share that with Moses's family. And so I think going back now, it was, it was so special because people are able to ask about my family, knowing about a lot of my family's traditions and values. And so a couple of things, a couple of examples actually is so interesting, Kristen, you mentioned Iceland and leaving their kids outside. So my mom grew up in Germany and she talks a lot about growing up in a similar way like that. Like she remembers her mom would leave her little brother outside in the stroller just to get fresh air. And like when my mom was six or seven, her dad would send her with a, like a beer glass to the bar to go get fresh beer. And then she'd like walk through town, get the fresh beer and bring it home and just had that similar independence. And so I think there was a lot of, when I've seen a lot of exchange of, sort of their traditional values between my parents and Moses's parents. And that really set us up for this cultural appreciation because we're doing an exchange of our, of our stories of our families. That's wonderful. I want to ask you about other aspects of the culture, such as the arts, the entertainment, the food, because I know that like when I travel, a part of me learning about a culture um, and appreciating that culture is through the things that really speak to, to them. So I always try to go to museums or, you know, certainly always look forward to eating the food. Are there some aspects that you can share there around cultural appreciation that you got an opportunity to experience? Oh, yeah. Oh, so much good food, Chris. And I'm glad you asked that question because I love to eat. <laughs> <laughs> same, same. <laughs> Yeah, there. I mean, there was so much wonderful food, and it's we eat a lot of Kenyan food at home. So ugali is kind of like fufu, so that's a like a corn meal that we that is used to sort of you make a little ball and you eat your food through that. And so we eat a ton of ugali, especially where they're from. They make like a red ugali with a different type of flour. Where they're from, uh, there's mm. also a lot of fish because we're by Lake Victoria, so we ate a ton of fish. Lots of, there's different vegetables. I don't know that we have here. I don't know the English name for them, but they also have some like medicinal values. So we ate just a ton. One of them is called apoth. That's one of my favorite vegetables. It's like, kind of like a, has a consistency of okra, but is in a leaf form, but gets kind of that same consistency of okra. And just, you know, cooking with each other. I had the chance to do a little bit of mm-hmm. cooking. So I made a couple of Chinese dishes and that was really fun to make that, do that cultural exchange piece. And I think a a big thing, especially with, you know, Africa as a continent, I think oftentimes we have this perception over here of all the negatives of Africa, like poor, dirty, developing country, all these types of negative things. And so I think a big part of cultural appreciation is really seeing so much of the richness. And there's an example that my husband often gives of his grandma was a farmer had this beautiful farm, did lots of permaculture. So just that whole idea of you have different types of plants growing with each other and coexisting and having this positive relationship on each with each other. And he, he jokes like the col- the colonizers came, they said only grow corn. And now they've come back and been like, oh, you should do this thing called permaculture. 
that we invented in the West. And so I think a big part of cultural appreciation is seeing kind of what is originally there and seeing a place for all the richness that it has and kind of trying to step away from some of the sort of new colonization of like this volunteer charity work, almost saying of like, oh, now we can come and we can fix you. Okay. Um, Another part of culture that is certainly central to most cultures in some way is, um, is music. Did you get an opportunity to experience um, anything around their music um, and instruments? Yeah, you know, I wish we would get to do more. We So Moses's father is actually a bishop. And so a big part of being there is going to church. And so a lot of church music, which is in Swahili, and a lot of singing. So, you know, every night there's prayer before going to bed. Every morning there's prayer, and that involves a lot of singing. There is a traditional instrument for their tribe there, the Luo tribe, called Nyatiti. And I've never gotten the chance to see that performed live. And that's a big thing on my sort of wish list that next Mm -hmm. time we go to be able to see a little bit more of the um, traditional music, which I haven't gotten to see when I've been there. You know, a lot of what I'm thinking about in terms of the appreciation piece for you, Martina, is just also, I mean, there's been a lot of relationship already built up because it's family, you know? And I think that, you know, you are, you and your whole family having spent time there before. But I just, you know, I was just really thinking about this idea of permaculture. You know, one of the connections that we have that, Martina, you haven't been there yet, but Christian and I have spent time on the Riddall, um, Riddall Green Partnership Farm in Cleveland. And, you know, they're called an urban farm and, you know, people are using a lot of this terminology, but their point, you know, this, this farm was started by four black men and their point is, you know, we, they would say, quote unquote, you know, that we started this a long, a long time ago. This is back to the, to the ways that were traditional in Africa and the relationship to the soil and everything. And, um, you know, as we do get deeper into that conversation of a cultural, cultural appropriation, we can really see how a lot of what is claimed as current culture is really rooted in other people's cultures in the past. And so you having an opportunity to see that firsthand um, sounds really powerful. Yeah, you remind me, it's really interesting. In Kenya, one of the main staple foods is actually kale. Hmm. And it's um, actually considered the food of the poor. <laughs> And so kale just grows everywhere and um, it's like just, it's what the poor people eat. And so it's so ironic comparing that to here, right? Where kale is like this fancy, super, can be very expensive food. And when I was sharing that with, you know, with family and with friends over there, they're just like in shock and just Mm -hmm. really laughing at how, wow, kale is for the rich people over there. How funny. By the way, I, I have to admit it. I'm a big kale fan. So wow. I apologize, but I am. I'm, I like kale, and I would and I would love if I could just walk down the street and pick pick it. <laughs> you know that would be awesome. It should be the food of it should be the food of everyone. Right. Don't no need to apologize. Kale is delicious, and it's so good for us. Yeah, you you need to come to Kenya. You can farm with just kale upon kale, and all the villages. That's awesome. Well, Martina, thank you so much for sharing this story with us. Um. We are going to come back in, in our last segment. We're going to delve a little bit deeper into this idea in general of cultural pre- appreciation. Like I said, I think your story is incredible. And also, I, one of the things I want to talk about when we come back is how would somebody do this if they didn't have that family connection? You know, like I'm really interested if somebody's traveling overseas um, to a different culture, how would you practice cultural appreciation if you weren't going to be? you know, centered in a family or a village or a city situation, you know, where, where you knew people and were, were related to people who knew a lot of other people. So I'm really curious what we all think about that. And that's just the kind of thing we'll explore more as we, when we come back. organizations in the social justice movement to find ourselves moving away from fighting against racism 
to creating human solidarity. What we found is that we could fight 24 hours, 48 hours, or all our lives, and after fighting all this time, we have nothing to show for it. It's because we haven't created anything for ourselves. At the Soul Focus Group, we are one of the few organizations who have moved from fighting against racism to creating an alternative to racism. And we invite you to join us. Let's stop fighting and start creating the outcome we really want to experience. So I just posed a question about how do we show cultural appreciation when we travel? And, you know, Martina, your example was going to a different part of the world, you know, Africa, which is um, for most of us in the United States feels very far away, quote unquote, very foreign, very quote unquote, exotic, all of these things. And I've, I have traveled a little bit, you know, I haven't traveled a ton, but I've traveled a little bit. And, um, you know, I really have tried to practice that idea of cultural appreciation wherever I've traveled. I've also lived places. You know, I lived in in um, Central and Eastern Europe for a year in the early 1990s. And when you live somewhere, obviously that changes things as opposed to going somewhere for two weeks or four weeks or whatever. But we were also, you know, just talking, and I, I think we can address this now too, is we don't have to go overseas to be in different cultures. Like, there are many, many different cultures within short amounts of time from where each of us are right now. And so just maybe if we could just talk a little bit about that, like how different um, things are, you know, places are culturally and people are culturally, even here in the United States. And what does cultural appreciation look like for us here, let alone as we travel around the world? I think the first thing that comes to mind for me is the fact that culture can mean different things in terms of, you know, I am a part of the American culture. I'm also, you know, I'm a spiritual being who happens to be American. So that's part of my culture. Uh, One who happens to be black, which that's another part of my culture. I happen to be a woman. That's another culture. And so, you know, sort of these layers of, of culture. And I think that the cultural appreciation for me really speaks to our ability to to learn and grow from um, understanding and accepting other people's uh, cultures and their experiences within those cultures um, as it relates to our own personal growth and us being able to share with them. So I love the definition of uh, cultural appreciation because it really to speak to this interconnectedness, like we are already interconnected as human beings, but we have this uniqueness about ourselves where we might belong to different cultures. And of course, we all experience different things within our cultures that we're able to share that with another person and them do the same with us and us embrace it, you know, and also participate in that culture as well. So, you know, in my city where uh, I'm, I'm in Cleveland, Ohio, and we have, you know, Little Italy, for example, that's a a culture. Um, And there are places in town where uh, it's mainly Asian. It's not necessarily called Asia town like it is in uh, New York and other parts, but or Chinatown, Um, you know, those sort of things that allows you to go to different parts and places to experience someone else's uh, culture. Um, and then, you know, staying grounded in your own at the same time. Yeah, Kristen, I think it's so true that we interface on a daily basis with so many different cultures just around us in the U.S. And I know for me, working for the Puyallup tribe of Indians, I'm going to an, a sovereign nation every day I go to work and I'm working for a sovereign nation. So I feel like every day I'm learning how to practice cultural appreciation and Like I said, I think for me, the biggest part of appreciating a culture is recognizing that there's, it's a two-way street, just like you were saying, it's about human connection. And so if I'm going wherever, you know, whether it's Chinatown or we don't have a little Italy or, you know, to the Puyallup tribe and saying, I just want to learn about you and not share anything about me, to me, that's not appreciating a culture because I really think appreciation is creating human connection. So it means giving a part of myself as well. And so I think for me, something that I've 
had to learn because I think in for me in medical school and in residency, we were sort of trained not to share about ourselves with our patients and that I've had to learn about sharing a part of myself when people are sharing their own cultural values or beliefs in, you know, in our patient interaction, also learning to share about my own culture and beliefs and the various levels of culture and the diversity of culture. So that way I'm not just taking knowledge and stories from people, but I'm also sharing my own knowledge and stories. Um, And a big part of that has been, you know, I think it's, I'm really interested in uh, traditional medicines. And so being able to ask people what, how they practice traditional medicine, if that is a part of their life and what they use, and then also being able to share acupuncture with people, which is a part of my culture. So being able to kind of have that two way street and say, Oh, this is the same for both of us. Oh, this is really different. Oh, why do you believe that? This is why I believe this. And so there's really this, this relationship building. Yeah. I think you, you both said something that, you know, sort of two different versions of the same thing that really stood out to me, which is, um, you know, staying grounded in your own culture, appreciating where you come from, but not overvaluing it, right? So to me, if somebody like wants to know, well, what is cultural appreciation and how do you practice it? For me, it feels like you stay grounded in who you are while being open to understanding and learning from other people's culture and allowing them to value who they are, right? So, you know, we at Soul Focus Group, we talk about how we've never had true integration of cultural consciousness because everybody has been asked to assimilate into one dominant culture, one dominant way of knowing and being. A huge part of cultural appreciation to me is that it's not, it's not saying that one culture is better or worse than others. So it's like, and I really like what you said, Kristen, about like you stay grounded in your own culture. So when you go to Little Italy, I mean, I, I certainly know because, you know, growing up in Cleveland, there's a lot of history between Little Italy and the surrounding black neighborhoods, you know, which I know is where where you grew up, you know, and not too far away from Little Italy, you know, in those neighborhoods. And there was a lot of tension. I don't know so much in your lifetime, but in my lifetime, there was a lot of tension, a lot of anger. There was violence between those communities. So like, what does that mean to you, Kristen, when you like, how do you like, if you go somewhere like Little Italy in Cleveland, how do you go from a place of appreciation while still staying strong and grounded in, in who you are in, in your, in your cultural way of knowing and being? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, just to comment on what, what you said in terms of the history between uh, little Italy and surrounding black communities, you're absolutely right. It's not something that I remember in my lifetime, but certainly uh, I can remember growing up and hearing the adults saying like, oh, don't go into little Italy. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't like, you know, they don't like us in there. Um, And I also graduated from Collinwood High School, which that community um, was uh, mainly Italian and Irish uh, community and and heard a lot of stories around that too, how, you know, Black students had to run home after school because they couldn't just be, you know, hanging around in, in the Collinwood area. And I think that because I haven't experienced it in, in my lifetime, even though I've I've heard things, I've always appreciated the culture in that area. I uh, worked in that vicinity uh, for a while. I live in that vicinity. I still live near there. Um, and I'm totally okay with visiting there, going there, shopping there. I think that I have just reached a place uh, in my consciousness where I understand that everybody has been programmed in a certain way. And so the unconsciousness of it is what make pe- makes people act the way that they do. Um, and so I don't hold that to them. I choose to see them as beings who are uh, navigating this space and they just don't know no better. They, they just aren't even conscious of um, their uh, ability to not appreciate <laughs> other cultures that are different from theirs. And um, so for me, it doesn't take away my ability to appreciate the Italian culture, for example, right? Because there were some people who chose to do some things or have a certain perspective. Overall, that culture has contributed to the structure and and overall 
overall culture in uh, America. And and I just appreciate that and whatever called contributions in the same way that I can appreciate the contributions that my cultures have uh, given to the overall culture. Yeah, I, I really, you, you said something. First of all, I really appreciate what you're saying. I, I'll, you know, I'll tell you that, you know, when I, when I was a kid, you know, like a teenager, I, I wouldn't go down, to, I wouldn't go into Little Italy at night, even as just as a Jewish kid, you know, because I mean, if I was recognized as Jewish, there was a good chance I could get my, my butt kicked. You know what I mean? So it was, it wasn't just racial, but it was ethnic too. Now I could probably blend in. I could probably pass as Italian, especially in the, in the, uh, in the like late seventies and early eighties when I, I could have passed as sometimes as like almost like John Travolta, but y'all wouldn't know anything about that. But, um, but, but that was real, you know, that, that kind of separation was real, but we also, as a family, like during the day, we used to go to Mama Santa's, you know, uh, to eat, you know, all the time. So it was a very different relationship, but something that you said that was really powerful to me was that you made that connection between cultural ap- appreciation and, um, consciousness, you know, the, um, being in a conscious state and not a subconscious state. Because when we're in a subconscious state around culture, that's when it's going to be very difficult for us to appreciate anybody else's culture because we're operating off of that default that our culture is somehow the quote unquote normal or the quote unquote best. And so you said that, which which really um, was powerful for me because if we're if we're talking about how do I practice cultural appreciation, then the way I practice it is by being out of my subconscious programming around the value and worth of my culture relative to other people's cultures. I think that if we focus so much on what we feel people have done to us or even historically, then it really takes away from our ability to come together in human solidarity, which is what the Soul Focus Group really has centered around. And we are looking to get to that place of human solidarity. And one of those ways is through the cultural appreciation, understanding that everybody is worthy. Everybody adds value to this space that we have to share on this earth. And we can let go of those illusions of subconscious programs that many have been ascribed to us or um, acquired by us, and we can let that go in order for us to connect on a very human level with other people who don't necessarily look like us or believe in the same things that we do or you know have different ways of doing things. We can still appreciate one another. Exactly, exactly. And you know, the definition of culture is a way of knowing, a way of being, a way of life. So it's really how we are being human. That's really all our culture is. So cultural appreciation is us appreciating the humanity of everybody that we come in contact with and seeing our own humanity, our own way of being human in other people's ways of being human. Yeah, I like that. Yep. Just appreciating each other. It seems so simple. (laughs) That's beautiful. So it's like cultural appreciation is just human appreciation, right? Appreciating each other. Yes, yes, yes. But that's why we had a soul focus group because soul focus group is going to get everybody back on track. We humans are good at making things complicated, huh? Yeah. I love that. That really sums that up like perfectly because I think that's exactly what it is all about. It's we get all confused by the labels and the identities. But one thing for sure, we are certainly human beings. Everything else is just variations of the same thing, which is why we are each so unique as individuals. And that within itself is to be appreciated. When you come to the Soul Focus Group, you come to an acknowledgement that there has been injuries done to us from all these different forms of oppression. Injuries that have impacted our subconscious mind, our heart, our spirit, our very soul. So at the Soul Focus Group, we recognize that and we focus on healing. 
healing, the return or the recovery of our connections to our healthy self, our beautiful thinking mind. We want you to come join us in a movement of healing all around the world to restore us back to our rightful state. At the Soul Focus Group, we heal. All right, well, that was an awesome conversation. Martina, first of all, thank you so much for sharing that recent trip with your family. Um, I really, I learned a lot. Uh, first of all, didn't didn't have any idea how kale was representative over in Africa. So that was amazing, or at least in Kenya. So I did learn a lot um, from your story. And I just want to thank you for for sharing that story with us today. Oh, thank you for giving me the chance to share. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, I think it's a great, a great, you know, place to build on. And uh, and and Kristen, thank you for bringing in the perspective. You know, I think this is something that we want everybody to be able to really think about. And I think um, both of you really helped us to get it to just distill it down to that place of of being human. Um, you know, in in my culture which, you know, I have many different cultures, but one of my primary cultures that I consider to be like life-giving culture, some of the cultures I'm a part of, I think are are more what we call like transactional, transactional cultures. So for me, I feel like whiteness is more transactional in this country, but like the more life-giving culture for me is my Jewishness. And my father, when I was growing up, he would always say to me, be a mensch, mensch, M-E-N-S-C-H. And I thought when I was a kid, you know, like a rebellious teenager, I thought Mensch was just like kind of a do-gooder, maybe like a little bit of a punk, you know, the, from the perspective I was coming from. But really, over time, I learned that what Mensch means, it means the best of being human. And um, so what my father was telling me was, he was telling me to always be the best of being human. And that's the cultural orientation that I try to hold to all the time. Is that, and not just for me, but also everybody I come in contact with, I look at them and I think, what is their, what is their story? Um, what brought them to this place? Uh, you know, I probably talk about this more in another podcast, but spending a lot of time with my mom at this new um, assisted living that she's in for right now, and you know, just the people that are serving them their meals and the aids, and I just, you know, I had a long conversation with her yesterday before I left town about how it's our responsibility to look at each of these people and just kind of feel, you know, why they're there in that position and to really recognize their humanity. So to me, the best of being human means to also see the best of everybody's humanity and to, you know, be empathetic and see, you know, why is somebody in the situation that they're in and show them love and respect regardless of their quote unquote position, you know? So that's, that's what I'm, that's what I'm holding right now from our conversation. I just thank both of you for your time and sharing your story, Martina, and for the discussion and the wisdom that always comes from these recordings. So I'm very, very grateful. Thank you. Me too. Just expressing my gratitude to both of you for giving me a chance to share a little bit about our journey and kind of my, my thoughts on cultural appreciation and what that looks like and having getting a chance to hear your perspectives and I you know how that plays out not only when we travel abroad but in basically every human interaction because each of us have di so many different cultures um, and so we're constantly in that exchange and learning how to appreciate each other. Awesome. Well, there's lots of appreciation going on here. Um, so I, I appreciate both of you too. And um and all that we bring, you know, the 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 different things that we each bring culturally um, to the table as podcast hosts at Soul Focus Radio. And we want to let each and every one of you know that we appreciate you. We love you. We care about you. We are so glad you're on this journey with us. Um, please like, subscribe, um, share what we're doing. Help us to grow. Go to soulfocusedgroup.com. Check out everything going on. Um, we are constantly growing and moving forward in the quest to to appreciate each other culturally, to gain and regain human solidarity. So we're so glad you're on this journey with us. And we're so thankful that you all are helping us grow. 
And we will ask you, as always, to please stay safe, stay well, and most of all, stay soul. Oh. Oh.